Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing for Tuesday, the 9th of April. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined this morning, fresh from Shield Inch, uh, Stevie Clifford. How's it going, Stevie? Ah, uh, yeah, good morning, Derek. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm still upstairs with the uh, Easter holidays being on, um, so we have this surroundings at the moment. But yeah, um, a busy couple of days, Derek, so looking forward to discussing Rangers this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we get stuck in, just a quick word uh, as ever for our podcast sponsors, mphboilers.co.uk. They've got some great deals on some Riesman boilers, uh, German engineering. You can't get much better than that. You get a free internet controller as well, I'm told, and they've got free. Uh, they've got some fantastic flexible finance options as well. The all-important links are in the descriptions uh, below. So if your boiler's knackered, uh, then give these guys a call. Um, right, Stevie, where shall we start? Well, first of all, I've not got your thoughts after Sunday's uh, manic game at Ibrox. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, Rangers <clears throat> uh, keeping it uh, interesting, you've got to say, thanks to uh, Rabbi Matondo's uh, screamer point uh, a piece. Uh, what was your, your, your takeaways uh, from the game before we start looking ahead to uh, the game that uh, we hope will be played on Wednesday? Um, uh, there's so much to unpack, isn't there? So I think that what I would say is I don't think a draw was a good result, but in the context of the game and how it went, I think the draw turned into a good yeah. result after being 2-0 down. I thought we were absolutely disgraceful in the first half, Derek, to the point where it's probably as bad as I've seen under Clement, certainly. And it was up there with <clears throat> probably Michael Beale's tenure in charge with regards to just the press didn't work, swamped in midfield, passing was, was terrible, individual choices on and off the ball really, really poor. So, very disappointed by the first half, Derek. Really, really disappointed. Positive in the second half that I thought individually, the subs um, and Dallas Ema made a huge difference. I thought that um, collectively we kind of got our act together and I thought we were good in the second half. That two wee minutes where they got the penalty and then mm. scored that goal that was unfortunately disallowed kind of rocked them a wee bit and then eventually did equalise but then within 20 seconds again gave it away and to come back I think to still get that point is is okay in the context of it so it's disappointing we didn't beat them at home because you would want to but as I said after that first half Derek it's just so so poor and it's the same actors in the same film that we've seen plenty of times letting us down and, and it just makes it really difficult to deal with I don't think you can legislate for a mistake like that after 20 seconds. I really nah, don't think you can. It's, it's so yeah. freakishly disappointing. We've seen it before, and it's just... But at least, at least, you know, Tav has the balls to kind of recover in a great second half penalty and, and, and kind of get himself together. But, Derek, it depends. I mean, how deep do we want to go into this? Because... um. You know, I, I think there's some serious questions to kind of answer about people in that team. And and I said to you last week, I wasn't sure about the midfield. Do you remember we spoke about it? And I said that I wasn't yeah. sure what was going on in there. Yeah. And I couldn't put my finger on what was wrong. And did Lundstrom and Diamandi compliment each other and things like that? Well, at the weekend on Sunday, I thought our midfield was atrocious. I thought that McClement got the selection wrong, unfortunately. Or the selection he went for didn't work. Um, I thought the two wide players, Silva and Wright, were really, really poor. Really, really poor. Silva's amateur dramatics in the first half drove everybody wild, Derek. Yeah. Really, really poor. Um, at least he came back and, and won the penalty, which again, you know, I think was a penalty. And yes, he touches the ball. He doesn't win the ball. There's a difference, and I don't think the commentators in Scotland understand that. No, you, you're a referee, Stevie. You're a referee, yeah. Stevie. I, I, I'm... It's it's the usual suspects that saying that it's it's not a penalty. It's clear as day, it's a penalty all day long, isn't it? Yeah, well, it doesn't matter if you touch the ball, right? Yeah. Tom Lawrence might have touched the ball as well, but he's still fouled. It's Fabio Silva's move. He's going past Johnson with that movement of the ball. Now Johnson does get a touch, but it's not enough to deviate the ball's exactly. movement or take it either way. 
if he had touched it and it had went to a teammate or it had went out for a corner or or something, you could justify that being him won the ball. But touching the ball does not mean you've won the ball. Likewise as well, Derek, something else to clear up as well. I've seen a lot of people say that the phase of play changed when Fabio Silva broke. It didn't, and I'll explain it as best I can. When Tom Lawrence commits that foul, Fabio Silva takes the ball immediately on the attack, so it's one phase. If he had played it around a wee bit in the, in the back, and then we went, that's phase two. But it's one phase yeah. he goes and attacks with. Celtic touch the ball in the box, but at no point do they regain complete control of the ball or possession, which is phase two. If the ball goes out of play, that becomes a different phase. So unfortunately for us, it's all the same phase. So there's 17 seconds, I think, between Silva picking up the loose ball and us putting the ball in the net, which is still within time to bring it back. So hopefully that kind of explains it. And I think, yeah, look, it's it's debatable. And I think um, Dermot Gallagher yesterday was right. Could it have stood? Could they have said it's not a clear and obvious error if he's looking right at it? I think he thinks that Lawrence touches the ball, which he doesn't, which yeah. makes it an error. Yeah. So I think we've just been, I think it's a correct decision, but I think we've been unlucky there. But we have got the correct decision from the penalty. Both of them are at similar heights and things as well. So I don't have any real complaints about anything that really went on on Sunday. I know that Beaton might have missed a couple of things, but VR VAR picked up. I think that's what it's there for. Yeah. So I think even with that, <clears throat> I had to look at the record books. Rangers to score three goals against them in any half. You have to go back to Dick Advocate's 5-1 victory at Ibrox for that to have happened. You have to go back to 1987, I think, uh, with the nine-men game for Ed mm. to come back from 2-0 down. So the spirit's definitely there, and that's the positives of the second half, the way that the team recovered and kept going. And I think, Derek, that we're in better shape as Matondo and Sima get ready to kind of add that pace and power on the wings, which I think they can. I thought Dessers was good at the weekend. I thought he gave it absolutely everything. I actually felt sorry for him. We were so unbalanced at times that he was the only one pressing and he was looking and the wingers weren't there so I think that there's a few options to change it up but I am concerned about the middle of the pitch I think that that needs tweaked something needs fixed it's maybe one for Joshua or Chris like better trained eyes than me that can pinpoint exactly what's going on but I, I don't see there wasn't enough mobility in there at the weekend Lawrence has got no legs John Lundstrom hasn't got the legs. He needed Sterling in there, Stevie. He, he needs and, Sterling in there. Well, that? I think so, but obviously he had to play at left back. I know. Conor Barisic also had the cold, didn't he? So he couldn't play at the weekend. And I think that's why they couldn't even have, have put Borna and put Sterling in there. I think maybe they would have mixed it up a wee bit. Yeah. Diamande, for me, is a technical player, and he took too long to get into the game. It was 40 minutes before he started getting his foot onto the ball, but... Some of our phases of play, Derek, some of our passing and things were so frustrating. But the other one I wanted to talk about just before we leave, and I realise that we're maybe going on about the old form too much, I think we've got a real problem at centre-back. The yeah. standard of goals that we're giving away yeah. is really, really difficult. And if, if we want to really talk about things seriously this morning, then Connor Goldson's performance on, on Sunday was would you, poor. Would you, drop, would you drop him for the game against Dundee? This is what I'm coming to. So I think that it's telling that with three, four minutes left, they brought him off at three each because <clears throat> I don't think he was injured, Derek. He sprinted off that pitch. Look injured, yep. So if they've taken him off because they can't trust him for the last three, four minutes because he is playing so poorly and Balogun just to shore things up and take that away from him, if they've done that, which I think they did, then I think we've got a real issue because... Conor Golson's been spooked for weeks now in terms of, we talked about it, since that Aberdeen goal that went over the top yeah. and Mijowski scored, I don't think he's recovered. And normally Conor has a wobble or two and then he comes back. He's not done that this time. And Theo Bear ripped him for Motherwell at Ibrox and he was extremely poor. But yes, uh, Sunday rather, his distribution, his delivery, his long balls, everything was overhit. Everything was indecisive. And see for the first goal, Derek, if you watch it back as well, it is James Tavernier's fault completely, and he makes the absolute mess of it. But Conor Goldson stops in the middle, 
he doesn't track back either. And if he offers that ball to the inside, perhaps Tavernier can just flick it and then Goldson gets it and stops. But both centre-halves yep. stopped. Yep. Sterling stopped. and Everybody stops. And we just weren't switched on. And Connor, for me, should have equalised at 1-0 with that header. Doesn't. And for such a big guy, his lack of conversion in our box attacking is, is extremely frustrating as well. And I think there is an issue. I would love to know what people think surrounding the midfield, surrounding Connor Goldson and our centre-halves as well. We cannot continue, Derek, to give away those standard of goals and, and expect to win big games. When we give, and yes, we've got a good defensive record, I get that, but the standard of goals we're giving away, home to Motherwell, the weekend there, yeah, um, even, ben, even Benfica, yeah. that was from our own corner. The away game in Benfica, Goldson's own goal when it wasn't even necessary and things like that. They're atrocious, Derek. So I don't expect Connor Goldson to be dropped because I think he's such a key figure that with the uh, seven games left, the, the potential to upset the dressing room and that might be huge. But I also think that it's telling that he came off three, four minutes before the end because that's never happened before. And I think the manager recognises. Yeah. It's a, a brave substitution, uh, a bit weird. It was necessary, Derek. He was all over the place, like literally yeah. all over the place. At that stage of the game, Stevie, yeah. I mean, it's just a, it was, I just thought it was a, a bit strange, but the right right call from, from the manager, um, just yeah, to, to show that up, he was uh, all over the shop. Uh, I would be tempted to bring in uh, Leon against uh, Dundee. Um, I think we've seen the Souter-Balligan partnership. We've seen it Easter Road, didn't we? Uh, when the team came back from the, the winter break. I think we've seen it somewhere else, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, he has to recapture his form pronto uh, because it is very concerning indeed. Uh, just before we move on, um, there was a, a few comments coming in. Uh, Richard Arv says, uh, Derek, how has there been no mention of uh, Carter Vickers' challenge on Cantwell? Rangers players need to start surrounding the ref and tell him highlighting it. Uh, I didn't see at the time when, when I seen it, I didn't, uh, it was only when I seen uh, the replays later on that evening that I was thinking, dear me, that was a yellow card all day long, Stevie, and he was fortunate to escape a yellow for kicking the ball away in the first half as well. He can consider himself lucky not to have been sent off on Sunday. Yeah, listen, I think there was a few of them. I think Maeda possibly was lucky as well, Derek, but yeah. what I will say, finally, about the weekend and I had to sit in the press conference and listen to Brendan Rodgers and Callum McGregor almost triumphantly, you know, say that they'll take Rangers back to, uh, back to Parkhead and that's a home game and that's three points for us and they're going to do this and they're in the driving seat and they're this and they're that. They're not all that, Derek. They There's been a lot said about Rangers' first half performance, a lot of it, but they crumbled in that second half from 2-0 up yep. and then from 3-2 up with, what, eight minutes left. And they couldn't handle our attack. They couldn't handle the pace of Seema. They couldn't handle... When Cantwell come on, actually, on that right-hand side with Seema and Tav there, they, they were completely panicking and they were all over the shop and it, and it gave us some ground. So credit to come on because I think the subs certainly made a massive difference in that. I'm not sure he got it right or it worked from the start, certainly. Yeah. But um, I think that, you know, they, they've... It's a foregone conclusion for them now that they'll win this league and they'll beat us at home. So I think that might suit us because there's a long way to go in every single game. And Rangers just need to get their head down and start winning games and shore things up a wee bit, become a wee bit more tighter. I think yeah. I would be happy to see in the next couple of games a couple of 2-0 victories. Just no fuss, just get it done and no thrills and, and get the confidence of being secure back again. And then we'll see what it takes us. But... I wasn't massively impressed by them, certainly in that, that second half, and, and they crumbled just as much as us in the first. And Derek, I'll tell you something, if, if we were 2-0 up at Parkhead at half time and should have been 3-4-0 and we didn't win that game, I would be pretty disgusted with, mm -hmm. with the club, with the team. So, you know, they can count that as a victory and things like that. Absolutely they can, but I don't think what that... you say, Stevie, it's, it's context. If if yeah. before the game we said it was going to be a draw, we would have been disappointed. But given the, yeah. way, the way it went, I think uh, we'll take it and move on. And Cyril Dessers uh, said it, uh, they felt good after um, after the game because of uh, the position that they were in. It could turn out to be a very valuable point in the long run. Um, of course, a big week for Rangers. Uh, two trips uh, in the space. 
uh, of the next uh, five days or what have you. We've got uh, Dundee on Wednesday, Ross County on Sunday up there at Dingwall. Now, uh, the game at Dens Park, uh, Dundee said yesterday they have no concerns about the likelihood of their match been postponed for a second time. Uh, the pitch, of course, was subject to two pitch inspections on Saturday ahead of their game with Motherwell. It was finally given the go-ahead just after 1pm. Motherwell were unhappy with the call. Sure, Kettlewell uh, voiced serious concerns about the safety of his players with large areas of the pitch covered in sand. Uh, now, interestingly, I've seen that report this morning about two alternative scenarios. If the pitch isn't deemed playable. Uh, one of those, uh, I think, is uh, delaying the match uh, 24 hours, so it would be played on the Thursday night instead of the Wednesday. Uh, and I've read that another scenario, uh, I don't actually get the thinking behind this, switch to a neutral uh, a neutral venue with no fans in attendance. What is going on, Stevie? This seems uh, bonkers. There is a, a yellow Met Office uh, alert for rain covering Dundee. Uh, and uh, I think Andy Halliday was saying uh, that the pitch was, uh, he played of course for Motherwell there, the pitch was a disgrace at the weekend. Uh, I've got serious concerns about this, Stevie. Um, I don't want the Rangers players taking to that field if there's uh, areas of that pitch covered in sand and it's dangerous for the players. Yeah, look, I think the situation is absolutely farcical, Derek, to be quite honest. I had to choose my words quite wisely then. And I don't know how a, a Premier League club can be in this situation. So, you know, the comment there is right. And I think what you said is right. It's supposed to pour down for the next couple of days. How does that survive? Now, I noticed they had covers down for the game at the weekend. Where, where are the covers for this one? So, you know, and why would Rangers be punished by having to play it behind closed doors? And we don't have supporters there. Why is this anything to do with our fault? So why are we getting punished for that? And then even if we do have to play that game, what state is it going to be in? Like, for our players. So for injuries. And listen, Derek, it's not like we've got the most robust squad. A wee bit of wind and half of us players are out for God knows how long. So, you know, put them on a surface like that, then, you know, does that mean could Sima play on it? Could Yilmaz come back and play on it? It's really difficult. So I want the game on. Of course I want the game on because so I. I think three points potentially are playing for three points because nothing's a given. And possibly going back top of the league might settle us down a wee bit. So I want the game on. I want these next couple of games played. And, you know, us to start finding a wee rhythm again. But I should never be in this situation. It's farcical that a bit of rain could potentially put games off. You know what, as well, I go as far as to say, see if they can't host it, then it's point deduction or they're forfeiting the points or they're playing it at our place yeah. and it, or whoever they're playing. Not only us, see if they're playing Aberdeen, Motherwell, Hearts, Celtic, whoever. See if they can't host this, then they don't get a chance to play for the points or you take it to the opposition's pitch because that's that's their issue yep so I, i'm sorry like dundee i've got no sympathy because they've allowed this situation to happen and it's really really disappointing so no i mean i don't know if there's much more to say about it like i'd rather just go on rangers go up there take care of them points in the bag off we go great but you're basically playing on a sand pit so I'm not yeah. sure how, and it's and it'll be. By the way, that was after a few weeks of nobody playing on it. It'll be even worse tomorrow night. It'll cut up. It'll be soft. You know, it'll be terrible bounce. It'll be difficult. The goal mouse are a total disgrace. And what happens if it rains during it and things like that? It's just it's a shambles that a, a top flight club can't handle a bit of rain. Yeah, uh, this is what Andy Hartley had to say. He said, uh, the surface is a disgrace. I'm absolutely amazed the game was given the go-ahead to, to go on. Listen, it's Monday, but I'd be really surprised if the game goes ahead on Wednesday if there's any more rain up in Dundee. Um, yeah, uh, and given the fact the game is live on Sky, uh, I mean, this is beamed around the world. Uh, it's an absolute 
shambles uh, that, that this is uh, the state of uh, the surface. The Dundee fans will be upset at this uh, as well. There's no doubt about it. They want a, a decent playing surface on there. It affects them as well. I'm a use, Stevie. Uh, play the game at Ibrooks. Give them the home dressing room if they want. Give them their uh, their, their home allocation. That uh, we'll take the the away allocation. Just get the game on um, because uh, mm. we can't have this game called off for a second time. Incidentally, uh, the Rangers press conference will take place today, folks. We should uh, get more of uh, an idea about the condition of the surface uh, tomorrow. We'll hear from Philip Clement uh, just uh, before one o'clock this afternoon uh, and whatever Rangers player is put up for the press. So, uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to hear from the manager. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's say the game is on, Stevie, um, does he have a, a bit of a selection dilemma on his hands? Does uh, Abdallah Sima start from the off? Does Rabi Matondo, after his uh, two worldies in as many games, start... Uh, from uh, the off, does Kamar Roof come back into contention? Uh, I know Chris, uh, and uh, when I was on with Johnny after the game on, on Sunday, uh, one of the big topics was, where, where is Nico Raskin? He's been uh, jettisoned somewhat, but uh, can you foresee changes? Yeah, um, and I think it's nice that he's got options. So I think, you know, the first big question is, does Van Yilmaz make it a left back? Then, <clears throat> if that's the case, Hopefully, um, he's going to play. Somebody's asking there about Danilo. Danilo's still several weeks away. He's not mm. back on the training pitch. Cortez hasn't even started in the gym yet. So, without sounding really harsh, forget about them for the first year. Yeah. Um, Red Van, I think. <clears throat> Red Van, maybe maybe in contention for tomorrow night and that's what that that gives you big options because like you Derek Dujon Sterling I want in the middle yeah. he is a midfielder that's his position I want him in the middle and something as I said before something isn't right in that midfield so something needs to change you either bring Diamandi out or you take Lundstrom out somebody's coming out of there I don't think you're dropping Lundstrom just because of the impact and how big a player he is rightly or wrongly whether or not I want to give him 30 grand for another two, three years is a completely different discussion. So at the moment, I think he starts. So there's there's an issue. I don't think Tom Lawrence should start. I don't think Tom Lawrence thing worked. Yeah, he was, put, he was so, poor on Sunday, wasn't he? Derek, he doesn't have the legs for that kind of game. He's not yeah. mobile enough and is passing and on ball. There was a couple of moments where he got into positions. I remember Dessers was out left and he tried to lob a pass and he kicked it straight to the goalkeeper. Yeah. So he was just completely off it. He wasn't the only one, but he was just off it. Yeah. So I would, you know, I didn't think we talked about it last week, and I told you I would have started Cantwell. So manager choice didn't work, or maybe it did work. Maybe that was his plan that Cantwell would come on and affect the game like he did. So whatever way, I think Cantwell has to start going forward. Um, in that position so there's midfield changes but definitely out wide look scott wright i really like scott wright i'm well documented like he's a nice lad he's he's you know he started off on fire at rangers and he, he made a big contribution but since then derek <clears throat> he's had numerous opportunities where he's played and hasn't hasn't performed in the slightest so mm. he needs to come out <clears throat> abdallah Seema does start for me i realize that the pitch but it's not an astro right so it's a different kind of surface. It's a bad grass pitch. So I don't think injury-wise, that's a a problem with his kind of muscle injury and that. So I would be willing to play Seema. Rabi Matondo on the left starts for me as well. I think that him coming in for Fabio Silva is a, a definite. Cyril yeah. Desson starts up top. So also seen a few people say that Kieran Dill maybe comes into contention. And this is a weird one when you talk about Nico Raskin not even making the bench, and then Kieran Dill come out of nowhere and get in 20 minutes. I think that's a kind of eye-opener a wee bit. But they obviously went for his energy, which did work to a certain extent. But Kieran Dill was also sleeping for the third goal, and then what he was doing with that pass across the face of goal, I'm not quite sure. Mm. But I think it highlights how static our midfield was at that point when he came on, that he made such a difference because he added just a wee bit of running power and legs. So there is options, Derek. There is absolutely options, but I don't think we can be. I don't think we can lack pace like we did at the weekend. I don't think we can be as as slow 
in the setup as we were at the weekend. So I would I would change it. And it's nice that he's got options. Does he do something really brave and change a back line? I'm not sure he would. Um, I think it's probably more likely Balogun and Goldson pair together than him taking Goldson out. So it's going to be interesting there. He's certainly got options. He's, he, he can certainly switch it up a wee bit. And I would I would make a few changes. Definitely Matondo and Sima. I would change the middle as well. I'm not sure if Diamandi comes out for me and maybe Sterling goes in. Could Yelmaz play at left back? If not, could Borna play at left at left back? Just to get that balance back a wee bit. Does Balogun come in? Balogun does come in for me. So it's going to be interesting. There's a potential for four or five changes from Clement that he, he certainly can make. Yeah, there's a few interesting comments that are coming in. Uh, Sam says uh, it would be interesting to see Sterling, Dio and Cantwell midfield uh, one day. Denzel with an interesting point as well. He says, uh, sad to say, I'd like to see both Goldson and Lunny rested. We shouldn't be messing with Sterling, playing him all over the park. He should be in the midfield. Uh, Ross, we had a point as well. He says, uh, would you stick Borna at left back and move Sterling into the middle? Surely Borna can cope against Dundee. You would like to think so, Ross. I said that, didn't I? So, yep. I think, yep. see, to be honest, Borna did have the cold. He wasn't feeling well at the weekend. So I'm pretty sure that that was the situation with him. Yeah. And, and why he didn't he was potentially coming on when Sterling was hobbling a wee bit after that block. So I think that affected the kind of overall choices as well a wee bit. Yeah. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what team uh, he selects if this game goes ahead. I'm a you, Stevie. I, th- I don't disagree too much with your choices there. Uh, whether he, he is brave and brings uh, Leon Balligan. I thought it was interesting when we were speaking about Balligan prior to the Celtic game uh, when he was asked about him uh, from uh, couple of uh, German uh, documentary makers that were in the press conference about Leon. He said that he's an inspiring figure behind the scenes and uh, he he would have loved to have uh, had him on the pitch in recent weeks, but he had to make so much changes in the the forward line that he was unable to do so. But uh, yeah, we've seen him coming on against Celtic. Would not surprise me if he was at the heart of that defence alongside uh, John Suter. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, Stevie, in the summertime, speaking to Johnny about this on Sunday, Leon uh, remains to be seen if he's offered a new deal, but he's not the future of the club at the back. John Suter will be there. Ben Davis, I'd imagine, would, the likelihood is he'll be moving on. Uh, if Connor is maybe the time for uh, a departing of the ways, Rangers might need a whole new backline. If Bonner, of course, leaving, I'd imagine there'll be a bit of noise around Ridfan. Uh, James Tavenier, of course, the, the Saudi interest we've heard over the last, uh, I think, uh, last summertime uh, isn't going away. Um Rangers might need a bit of a reshaping in there. Listen, I think it's sad to say that once again, Rangers are going to be in a position where it's going to be a very busy summer. Yeah, It was supposed to be that last year fixed this so that we didn't have to do this. But unfortunately, I think we're going to be in a position where there's going to be a lot of work done in the summer, regardless of where this season finishes. And I think it's right, Derek. The time's right. We cannot keep having these big games where the same people are involved in the same talking points and the same mistakes and things like that. So I think the time might be right. And with regards to John Lundstrom and things like that, I said this and I'll, I'll continue to say it, we should reflect on that at the end of the season. But anybody that wants to give John Lundstrom 35, 40 grand, high-end wages and a three-year deal, I think is way, way off. John mm-hmm. Lundstrom has had a massive upturn under the manager, I think he has, but he's also began to fade again in the last four or five weeks, which I think is telling in our performance level as well. I thought John Lundstrom tried at the weekend, I really did, but struggled with the pace of the game, and we can't afford to have that in our midfield. When you're up against, look, and I'll be brutally honest here, Hitati O'Reilly Awata are really fit young guys, really energetic, loads of legs in there. We cannot go with Lawrence, Lundstrom, Diamandi. Now, I happen to think Diamandi's got a good engine on him, but he was lost. He looked lost. His passing was all over the place. There was nothing for him to hit up front. So I would like to see Diamandi without Lundstrom. But the issue is, Derek, that with seven games left, making massive calls like taking Golds and Lundstrom out is huge. So I understand it, and people, you know, maybe just say, I'll do it, but... The influence in the dressing room and things, you've got to consider everything when you're when you're doing changes like that. So I'm not sure that they will be made, but for the greater good, 
you know, you're talking about the defence and midfield, even up front. There is huge, huge changes required. At the club, there'll, there'll be another big turnover. You're talking maybe, I can see as many as dozen and dozen in and out. So I think that I would be surprised if it's not such a big turnover like that, which comes, you know, massive issues again. What happens if that doesn't work? And we need to stop this cycle. But I think the squad now is at a stage, regardless of how it ends. Look, I would love to end champions and a cup or two in the bag. Look, I would love that. Of course we would. And I think that would be service wise and what they've how many games have played for the club and contributions, and everything. I think that'd be great for a few individual players. But it's the right time in the summer to to maybe make some really big and difficult decisions surrounding some of our, our big players. So you can't be sentimental. No, I don't think you can, but I think the more that these things keep happening, Derek, I think we need to be brave about some of our conversations and say, talked about it in the blog yesterday a lot on Four Lads, talked about it on the podcast on, on Four Lads as well, Derek, so people can look at them and check them out. But it's difficult. I'm not wanting to come on and two-foot our team and two-foot our players because we're in a great position, Yeah. regardless of what anybody else says. You know, it's in their hands, like they've said, absolutely. Still in our hands. So we've got a lot to play for starting off at Dundee you know, on Dundee's golf back nine is the way it'll be with those big bunkers in the middle of it. But, listen, it's still in our own hands. So, you know, everything from everybody, get that game on, get the team selected, get behind them. Let's get the three points. Let's get up the road, settle down a wee bit, start to compact a wee bit, make it tighter, make the team tighter and more difficult to beat. Walter done that loads of times. Mm. Derek, when, when we needed results and just made us compact and difficult to beat, then went and got the results. And clean sheets and three points breeds confidence anyway. So let's let's get back to doing that a wee bit and then see where it takes us. The summer's a, a massive different conversation yeah. for yeah. for the summertime. But speaking briefly on it, I think a lot of us would be in a position where they might say it's time for some wholesale changes and big brave changes just to freshen and and go from there. But yeah, look, there's a lot of work to be done. Defence, midfield, forward line, all of it, Derek. All yeah, of it, I know, I know. you know. So, and, and you can't change everybody. You can't sell twenty players. It, it's yeah. impossible. You can't get rid of twenty. So, there's going to have to be people that stay. You know, there's going to have to be a wee bit of juggling about and things like that. So, it is interesting, but that's for the summer. For the moment, he's got potential to mix things up for Dundee and Ross County in a positive way, as well. Yeah, well, just off the back of that, we'll finish up with this. This is an interesting point. Something I seen in the news last night. Ross with a point here. He says, uh, why are we not going for young Connor Barron on a free? Ticks all the boxes. We need an engine like that in the middle. Reports uh, that a couple of uh, Serie A clubs have uh, made contact uh, with him. He's out of contract at Aberdeen at the end of the season. Calgary and uh, Sassuolo are believed to be keen on signing Connor Barron. Um, Aberdeen would be due, a, a, I think, a half a million pound Run about that development fee. Rangers should be all over this, Stevie. We've spoke about this. Yeah. Derek. We've spoke about it. We've covered it. Um, I'm not sure he's interested from what I've heard. I'm not sure he's interested. I'm sure that he sees his future as being very much like Lewis Ferguson, Aaron Hickey, mm. people like that who've went abroad and got big moves on the back of it. So that might be a non-starter that we don't know about. Maybe Rangers have went in and inquired. But we spoke about this months ago when yeah. we talked about Scottish prospects. Um, Watson, Kilmarnock, Miller, Miller. Well. Yeah. Conan Barron, Aberdeen. Boy, the boy, Kilmarnock, a good player as well. Um, I Watson, that's the one yeah. I was talking about. There's, yeah, there's a boy at Dundee United who's shown up really well as well. The name forgets me. I need to go back and, and look. So there's, there's potential in Scotland where you could pick up guys and... and really help progress them. Conor Barron's somebody that I think is a no-brainer in terms of coming in for Ryan Jack, replacing that like for like. He's young, he's got an engine on him, He's he's got everything that we maybe want from a young Scottish player in terms of, you know, um, winning the ball, tackling. His, his... I would need to go, this is kind of throwing me a wee bit, I do have Conor Barron stats somewhere and his, his percentile oh. of, of winning second balls and all that are really high. 
Yeah. Because I did look at um I did look at stuff. Rangers Journal done a really good bit on it as well, Kai. Online, which is a really interesting read on Connor Barron and what he brings to the game as well. So maybe Derek, maybe we went in and looked at it and maybe there is something going on behind the scenes where we can't get him, or maybe we're just sit, sitting patiently waiting to see where and whereabouts. I don't know, but if it was me, I would be making more use of Scotland in terms of what's around us because to build a squad, like we're going to have to, again, unfortunately, going back to a wee bit what I said before, you have to have players that know what it's all about and can settle straight away. So what is our six or seven out of contract as well as players we might want to move on? It's not foreseeable, as I said, that or unforeseeable that, you know, we might be a dozen out the door, Derek. So, you know, maybe there is a few based in Scotland that we can go and pick up. We've had this conversation. Conor Barnes a player I like. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll leave it there, folks. Uh, thanks for the question, Ross, and thank you to each and every one of you for tuning in. As I mentioned earlier on, press conference day. We'll hear from Philip Clement uh, around about uh, just before one o'clock this afternoon, folks. Uh, as ever, uh, we'll have uh, the press conference on the YouTube channel, the transcript on the website. Chris will be at the Rangers Training Centre for us. So uh, those of you that are members on the YouTube channel will have a, a press conference reaction video to come a little bit later on. Uh, huge thanks uh, to Stevie, as ever, and uh, thank you, for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that and we'll speak to you a little later on. Bye for now.